This lecture is part of Berkeley Maths 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be more about primitive roots um, for numbers p to the n, where p is an odd prime. So I just recall what we, where we got to at the end of the previous lecture. What we were doing was we were trying to show that the only numbers with primitive roots were the numbers 1, 2, 4, and p to the n, and 2p to the n for p an odd prime. Um, and we proved most of this. We proved that numbers that weren't of this form didn't have primitive roots. And we proved that numbers of this form had primitive roots provided n was equal to 1. So we've still got the case of p to the n where p is an odd prime um, and n is greater than 1 to talk about. So what I want to do is to show that in these cases um, there's always a primitive root. Um, the first case is to show that p squared always has a primitive root. Um, and to do this, um, we, 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 we just pick a primitive root, let's call it g of p. We know that p has a primitive root by the previous lecture. Um, this means that g to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p and not for any smaller um, numbers. Um, and so, so, so phi of p minus 5p is p minus 1 and phi of p squared is p times p minus 1. So the order of g is p minus 1 modulo p. So the order of g mod p squared is either p minus 1 or p times p minus 1 because it must divide p times p minus 1 by Euler and it must be divisible by p minus 1 because it's a primitive root mod p. So if its order is p times p minus 1, then g is a primitive root mod p squared, so we are done. So we've got to examine this case where the order of g mod p squared is p minus 1. Um, so um, in this case, we have g to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p squared. Now we look at g plus p. And we notice that g plus p to the p minus 1, um, which is equal to g to the p minus 1 plus p minus 1 times p. Here we're expanding by the, by the Taylor series. So that's, um, that's really p minus 1 choose 1. So we have p minus 1 choose 2, um, um, p squared plus higher powers. So this is congruent to 1 plus p minus 1 times p mod p squared. And we notice that this thing here is not congruent to 1 mod p squared. So this means that g plus p does not have order p minus 1. So it must have order um, p times p minus 1 because it's a primitive root modulo p. So either g or g plus p is a primitive root um, mod p squared. It's quite possible that both of them are primitive roots mod p squared, of course, but th there's at least one. So p squared is OK. There's always a primitive root modulo p squared. Um, now, what about p to the n for n greater than or equal to 3? And this gets a little bit tricky because we notice that 2 cubed has no primitive root. So we'd better explain why um, the prime 2 behaves differently from all the, um, all the odd primes. And here we have the following theorem. If g is a primitive root mod p squared and p is an odd prime, then g is a primitive root mod p to the n for any n greater than or equal to 1. Um, and um, the, the, the idea is we just use induction on n, 
So we've got to show that it is a primitive root mod p to the n, and it's a primitive root mod p to the n plus 1. Um, so what we want to do, um, we need to show that um, g to the p minus 1 times p to the n minus 1 equals 1 plus t times p to the n for some t not divisible by p, because this will show that um, um, th 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 this um, is, a, is a primitive root modulo p to the, e p to the n plus 1. Um, so it holds for n equals 1 by assumption, because we assumed it's a primitive root mod p squared. Now we raise both sides to the power of p, and we get um, g to the p minus 1 to the p to the n. Um, and now we, we expand this by the binomial theorem. So we get 1 plus p t p to the m plus p choose 2 um, t squared p to the 2 m plus higher powers. Um, and now uh, we use the fact that p is not 2. So this is divisible by p if p is greater than 2. If p equals 2, then there's a 2 on the denominator which cancels it out. And all these extra terms are divisible by a, a rather large power of p. So, so this is of the form um, 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 1 plus t times p to the m plus 1 plus um, something um, divisible by p to the m plus 2. So it's again of, of, of this form here. So if you've got a primitive root modulo p squared, then it's also a primitive root modulo p cubed and p to the 4 and so on, provided p is odd, because if p is even, we run into this problem that the binomial coefficient is not necessarily divisible by p. So that's why things go wrong for p equals 2. There's a sort of technical point in the middle of the proof where you need to use the fact that p is odd. So, for example, let's find a primitive root of 3 to the 7. Well, we can start with the primitive root of 3, and the simplest primitive root of 3 is just minus 1. And the problem is this is not a primitive root of 3 squared. I mean, it only is order 2. So what we do is we take minus 1 plus 3, and then this is a primitive root mod 3 squared, and this is of course just 2, and so it's a primitive root mod 3 to the 3 to the 7, because once you found a primitive root modulo 3 squared, um, it's automatically a primitive root modulo any power of 3. Um, so let's just summarise um, everything we've proved, or sort of proved. So we have a big summary. So the following are equivalent. Um, first of all, M has a primitive root. And we saw that if M has a primitive root, then it has phi of phi of M primitive roots. Um, otherwise, it has, so it either has phi of phi of M primitive roots or it has zero primitive roots. And um, the third condition is that M is equal to 1 or 2 or 4 or p to the n, or 2p to the n, where p is an odd prime. So that gives a, a, an explicit description of everything. The fourth condition is that Wilson is, is that x squared congruent to 1 mod m implies x is congruent to plus or minus 1 mod m. In other words, there are only two, or possibly one, square roots of 1. And we sort of saw... Um, we sort of more or less proved this in the course of, of, of finding all the numbers of primitive roots. We, we saw that um, if M has a primitive root, then there can only be two solutions of this. And conversely, if there are only two solutions of this, you see that M has to be one of these numbers that we've, that we've checked. And the fifth condition is that Wilson's theorem holds. Um, 
So Wilson's theorem says that if you take the product over all A, such that A is co-prime to M, um, this is over all, all, all things modulo M such that A is co-prime to M, then this is congruent to minus 1 mod M. And we recall we showed that this is actually equivalent to condition 4. Um, if you want, you can show directly that if M has a primitive root, then this product is congruent to minus 1 because the product is over all the powers of a primitive root, and you can easily work that out. Um, so the numbers that don't have this property, so the numbers with this property are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, 8 doesn't, um, 9 does, 10 does, 11 does, 12 doesn't, um, 13 does, 14 does, 15 doesn't, 16 doesn't, and so on. So, so um, to start off with, all almost all numbers do have primitive roots, but the ones without primitive roots start becoming more and more common. Um, there's one sort of loose end we haven't really talked about. Um, so you remember we can reduce the case of arbitrary m to the case of prime powers. Um, by using the Chinese remainder theorem. And for odd prime powers, we've shown there's a primitive root. But what happens if we're working mod 2 to the n for n large? Um, well, it turns out there's something pretty close to a primitive root. So 5 is almost a primitive root. Um, more precisely, um, any number mod 2 to the n um, co prime to 2 to the n is of the form plus or minus 5 to the 5 to the k. So without this minus sign, that would just say 5 was a primitive root because everything would be a power of it. But but we, but we in general we have to put a minus sign in. Um, so um, the, the numbers of the form 5 to the k are the ones that are the form 1 mod. 4, and the ones of the form minus 5 to the k are the ones that are minus 1 mod 4. So we sort of get a primitive root if we restrict to numbers that are co-prime to 2 to the n and also congruent to 1 modulo 4. Um, the proof of this is a little bit like the proof that um, we have a primitive root for odd prime numbers. So, so we can say 5 is congruent to 5 mod 8, which is rather trivial. 5 squared is congruent to 9 mod 16. Um, 5 to the 4 is congruent to 17 mod 32. Um, 5 to the 8 is congruent to um, 33 mod 64 and so on. And you can sort of prove by induction that in general 5 to the 2 to the n is congruent, is, is congruent to 1 plus 2 to the n plus 2 modulo 2 to the n plus 3. And what this does is it, is it shows that 5 has order 2 um, to the n plus 1 modulo 2 to the n plus 3. So, so it would order exactly this. And that means that the numbers of the form plus or minus 5 to the n form 2 to the n plus 2 numbers mod 2 to the n plus 3. And as that's the number of things co-prime to 2 to the n plus 3, Every number co-prime to 2 to the n plus 3 is, is either a power of 5 or minus a power of 5. So we've almost got a primitive root modulo 2 to the n, except we have to add, add an extra sign in. Um, so what are some applications of primitive roots? Well, primitive roots can be used to define logarithms. Um, except logarithms in number theory are usually called indices. So um, suppose we pick g as a primitive root mod, mod p, then any a not congruent to 0 mod p is of the form um, um, g to the n mod p. So we can think of n as a sort of log to base g of, of the number a. Um, so um, we can now use these sort of p-adic logarithms or indices in much the same way that you use logarithms um, for ordinary arithmetic. 
Um, so if we want to multiply numbers, suppose we want to multiply a times b, um, if we work out the logarithm of a, we can write a is equal to um, g to the n, and we might, might write b is equal to g to the m. So a times b is equal to g to the m plus n. So if you want to multiply numbers mod p, we take their logarithms, add up the logarithms, and um, then take g to the power of that. Well, that seems a bit silly, but um, in the days before computers, it was actually quite a neat way of multiplying numbers. And some old books on number theory would sometimes contain tables of logarithms and indices. So I've actually got a picture of one here. Um, so this is Vinogradov's book on number theory. And at the end, he's got this table of indices, which tells you the... Um, the sort of logarithm of a number two to the base of some primitive root. And he also, um, so there's a table of indices, and um, there's also a table of the, the smallest primitive root of various primes. So um, if you look through it, you can see the smallest primitive root is usually fairly small. It's usually less than 10 for small primes. Well, there's an example where it's 19, so it occasionally gets a bit big. But if you go all the way up to prime top to about 4,000, it doesn't get much bigger than that. So there's one that's equal to 22. Um, there's one that's 23, but I can't see any bigger than that. So the, the smallest primitive root is usually pretty small. In fact, there's a, um, judging from this table, there's a pretty good chance the smallest primitive root is two or three. Um, so you can also do things like work out powers as well as multiply things. If we work, want to work on a to the k, then this will be just um, g to the n um, to the k, which is equal to g to the n k. So you work out n, you multiply it by k, and then you then you um, look that up in your table of antilogarithms. Sorry, I forgot to um, magnify down. So, so I was just saying to work out a to the k, you just write it as g to the power of n to the power of k. Um, um, so... Um, another application is to prove that a number is prime. Suppose we've got a very large number p, and we've done some primality tests, and we, 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 we've decided it's probably prime according to these primality tests, but say we're a bit paranoid, and we would like to be absolutely certain that it's prime. Um, well, there are some um, algorithms that will actually do that, but they're a bit complicated. So here's a simple test. If we can factor... P minus one explicitly, then then it's quite easy to prove p is prime. So we can find a primitive root of p. So that's a number a. Let's call no, let's a number g of order p minus one. And we can prove that it's of order p minus one. We just check g does not have order. Dividing um, p minus 1 over q, where q is a prime factor of p minus 1. So we just have to look at all the numbers g to the p minus 1 over q for q a prime q divides p minus 1 and just check that this is not congruent to 1 modulo p. So if we find a number g with this property, then this implies that g has order exactly p minus 1. Um, so um, this would imply that p must actually be prime. For example, um, suppose we want to check that 101 is prime. Well, we factor 101 minus 1, which is um, 2 squared times 5 squared. So we just need to find g such that g to the 100 over 2 is not congruent to 1, and g to the 100 over 5 is not congruent to 1. And this will then show that g has order 40, and so is a primitive root. Of course, I should have said we, we also need to check that g to the 100 is congruent to 1, but if it isn't congruent to 1, then we would have shown that 101 isn't prime, so we would be done. So we just need to check these, and then we've got a complete proof that 101 is prime. Uh, of course, for 101, that's a bit silly, but for larger numbers, this can actually be used to give primality proofs. Um, I must admit this is not a terribly good method because it relies on factoring p minus 1 
and factoring p minus one is rather difficult. There are faster but rather more complicated ways to prove that numbers really are prime. Um, okay, I think that'll be all about primitive roots.